Hi, I'm Ariel Demaras, and I'm hosting a new podcast called Vice News Reports. With so much going on around the world, so many people telling you they have the definitive take on the news, we bring you to the news so you can hear it for yourself. From the newsroom that has earned more Emmy nominations than any other news team, this podcast goes where the story is, from conflict zones to the labyrinth of digital life. You've never traveled quite like this. Get the Vice News Reports podcast on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. After you listen to today's podcast, here's one to add to your playlist. I'm Christian O'Connell, and I've had this thought for a while. What if you took the world's funniest and most interesting people and asked them to share the stories behind their three most treasured items? When you said the idea, I thought, that's a really good idea. No doubt about it, the guitar. I think I know the, the same chords now as I did when I was 14. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> From iHeartRadio, this is The Stuff of Legends. Add it to your playlist for free. Just search for Stuff of Legends in your podcast app. It's Thursday, August 27th. What is the point of a TV political pundit? They're everywhere you turn these days. TV news networks rely on them during election years more now than ever before. Cable news networks have more talking heads on the payroll than actual news anchors. And whether they call them pundits, analysts, experts, or contributors, they are ubiquitous, arguing their positions, sometimes volatile, always opinionated, and almost never completely right. Political punditry is almost as reliable as weather forecasting, but without the benefit of actually any science. Only the wisest and most expert of this particular category of operative can expect any longevity in the business. Only those who consistently tap into the current political trends of the American electorate are trusted to return and weigh in election year after election year. One of those familiar faces is Paul Begala. I'm Clay Aiken, and this week... Politicon welcomes one of the most recognized and celebrated political commentators on the left to talk about the current state of the Democratic Party he served for over three decades, to talk about the 2020 election cycle, and his new book, You're Fired, The Perfect Guide to Defeating Donald Trump. Is a defeat of the sitting president as possible as progressives would like to believe it is? And is candidate Biden doing what's necessary to do so? Have the lessons of 2016 been learned by Democrats, or are we on a path to a repeat? Are conservatives, moderates, or the left wing of his own party the bigger roadblock to Biden's success? Are Democrats falling into the trap set for them by Donald Trump? And win or lose, how the heck are we going to get along? Have you been watching the... Have you, I'm assuming you've been watching the conventions. I have. I have. It's my job, so I have to. Right. Any, <laughs> any, it, that's, that was probably not the hardest job last week, but how about this week? Yeah. How are you feeling? How are you feeling the last two nights? You know, as a professional, I don't think they have a strategy. You know, they don't know, is Joe, you know, is Joe doddering? Is he uh, a socialist? Is, you know, it, they, they don't have a theory of the case yet uh, against the Democrats. Um, and they certainly don't have a forward-looking agenda. They do have lots to rally their base, lots of it's mostly just grievances and anger and, you know, and that's good. That'll get a lot of people, but it's not going to get you 50 percent. But I mean, the Democrats sort of had a little bit of a base strategy last week on the first night or two. And, right. and it felt to me like a shift towards talking to everyone a yes. little bit more on Wednesday and Thursday. That's exactly, do you anticipate that's exactly right. do you anticipate that? The Republicans may have that same strategy. Do you do you expect I, them to try to expand tonight and tomorrow night? I I I don't think Trump has it in him. You know, I mean, B B Biden. I think you're right. He had a progression in his his like a miniseries. Um, and and any good party has to start with its base and then build outward. Um, but he doesn't. I mean, he had that one uh, state representative in Georgia, but you know, Biden's got dozens of Republicans, and um, that's what I want as a strategist, right? And I'm probably a little more moderate than maybe some of the people in my party. And I want reaching out to the other side. And he doesn't seem to have that in him. And I think some of it is because so much of his appeal is based on grievance, on anger. It's like, I have friends who are for Trump and they'll say that. Well, he has all the right enemies. Like, well, okay. How about what's good for you? <laughs> well, I mean, you don't, you didn't sense any, there's a little bit of that anger too from Democrats as well. I mean, the, the vice president Biden didn't mention Trump's name, I don't think. I, I don't watch it as closely as you have to for your job, but he didn't mention Trump's name at all in his speech, but obviously people like 
uh, Michelle Obama and, and even Kamala Harris did a little bit. And the president complained about that and said it's just a lot of anger. And well, and Barack dark. Obama. Yeah. Well, obviously, I mean, they, Barack Obama did. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I just I, I do think there's a, an important difference between saying it, and this is actually we should talk about this in the show. This is like the whole point of my book is that Democrats should say Trump has done bad things that hurt your life, your career, your health, your family. Not simply say he's a bad man. In other words, I, I think he is. I think he's sorry. He's a sorry guy. But I don't think that's the right way to win. I think you got to make it about people's lives. I mean, Donald Trump won in 2016 with that negativity, though, right? I mean, are we he at did. a point where, uh, I, listen, I, I ran for Congress and found out the hard way that that it's not like the West Wing. <laughs> you know, right. I really I really wanted my campaign to be like Terry Sanford ran his, and I oh, now realize God that's not the soul. way it works. And so uh, negativity seems to be what works. It seems to be what fires people up. It seems to be what not only gets the base out, but if you scare somebody into thinking that Hillary's crooked or Trump is crooked or Joe is senile or, or Kamala's a socialist, that seems to work the best. And, and I have to say, your book, You're Fired, uh, which is a uh, helpful guide to What's the, what's the subtitle? I don't have that open. The, the um, perfect guide to the beating The perfect Trump. guide to beating The perfect Trump. guide. Um, it is. There you go. So what, I love what you say in it, though, which is to try to have that positive message. But, Paul, does that work anymore? Or do people just tune it out? Are they just looking for Twitter, for tweets that are 140 characters long? See, I think that's why Joe Biden won the Democratic nomination, because he didn't campaign in Twitter Nation. You know, maybe there's an advantage to being 77 years old. He didn't go for the most radical Twitter people in his party. He went for the heart and the soul, which is the middle of his party. And I, I think, I really believe this as a matter of strategy as well as a matter of ethics, which is only light can drive out darkness. And Biden said that in his speech. Um, and, and if people want division, they've got division. If they want anger, They've got anger. And the Democrats, no one, certainly not Joe Biden, who's basically a sunny guy, no one can match Trump on that. So if that's what the country wants, God bless them. We have that. They'll keep that. I think people want to change. When you get 80% of the country saying we're moving in the wrong direction, when you get uh, all kinds of Republicans saying, well, wait, he's not my kind of Republican, I, I think the Democrats have to be different. I think that's why they picked Joe. I think he is, in, in tone and temperament, the opposite of Trump in every way. You know, Trump is very divisive. Joe is very unifying. Trump is very narcissistic. Joe is very empathetic. Uh, tr Trump, before he ran for president, never served a day in the military or the government. First pre president in American history. Joe has deep experience. So it, when you fire a president, which we've only done four times in the last hundred years, when you do, it's because you want the remedy, not the replica. Now, when I was writing this book, I, I talked to one of the most senior people in Trump land, very, very close to Trump, and one of the people who engineered his victory, who said to me, just what you were saying, Clay, what he said, what you don't get is that division sells, anger sells, hate sells. And that's what's that's what won it for us last time. It's what's going to win it for us next time. Uh, it it worked last time, but man, just barely. He lost the popular vote by 2.8 million and just snuck the goods through customs in those three key states of Michigan, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. I, I think it's a much better strategy. It's also much better ethics to try to heal and unite. Well, listen, I'm not going to disagree with you at all. And I, I don't, I, I, I love what you write in your book because it's actually the way I personally wish we would return to running the country and, and return to running politics. I don't know if I, I worry that, that division sells, but I do think, I do think that it motivates more more so than than sales, but it does motivate. I mean, if you look, tell me, let's talk about what's going on in Wisconsin right now, right. and and obviously we've seen we've seen senseless killings of unarmed black men in this country for decades, um, but we've really seen a lot of attention paid to it, especially this summer. But we've also seen some of the protests turn violent or. Even if it's not the protests that are turning violent, we've seen some violence happening around some of the more peaceful protesting, and that's getting a lot of attention. And I think that um, we've noticed that, or at least some pollsters have no started to notice that in focus groups, that rather hyperbolic 
accusation that was thrown around at the convention the last few nights of uh, Biden wanting to defund the police and Biden wanting to abolish the suburbs. I don't even know what that means, to be honest with you. But, <laughs> but oh, but I do. That's that is starting to. That is. He, I know what I know what they're. I know what they're dog are. whistling. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. what they're dog whistling. But I don't know yeah. how you abolish a suburb. But I mean that type of that type of message pollsters and focus group folks are starting to see begin to resonate a little bit. So how do you combat something like how what should Joe Biden and his campaign be doing to combat this particular issue that that may be be the first thing that is sticking of Trump's attacks? Well, the first what Biden did is he called the family of Jacob Blake, the young man who's fighting for his life, shot seven times in the back. He called the family to show that he cares, to talk. Now, why our president hasn't visited the family, much less called them. We'll get to him in a minute. But what Joe did is what he ought to be doing. First thing you reach out to that family, they're in pain and they're in crisis. And the, the grace that they have shown has been remarkable. And uh, Jacob's mom was on CNN and she said, please don't turn to violence. Please don't destroy someone's home. Please don't destroy someone's business. That is not what Jacob wants as he's fighting for his life. It's not what I want as his mother. Uh, That's a wonderful, beautiful message. And Biden picked up on that today. He put out a video uh, denouncing violence in very strong terms, denouncing uh, looting or vandalism or or, uh, rioting. and said that he had spoken with that family and was really moved by what Jacob's mom had said to him on the phone. It's what I suspect, the same thing she has said to the country. So you have to get out there and say that uh, because it's real. Again, if, 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 if we want division, we have that. I think Mr. Trump fosters and feeds that division. Uh, he did it in Charlottesville. I live in Virginia. I had a son at the University of Virginia at the time in Charlottesville. And this is, I think, a really a big important difference between the the, the today's progressives and today's far-right extremists. Those far-right extremists went to Charlottesville. They were saying racist, anti-Semitic things as they marched. One white supremacist, neo-Nazi, murdered a a young woman. Heather Heyer is her name. After Heather was murdered, I went there the next day. And you know what we do in America? We make these makeshift memorials. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cards, flowers, teddy bears. Clay, I, I went there. I said a prayer. And I must have spent 90 minutes. I tried to look at every one of those messages, tried to read them, tried to absorb this as a dad, as well as a citizen. And all of them said things like, there's one more angel in heaven. Uh, Rest in peace, rest in power, some said. Um, We love you, Heather. Um, Not one, not one said, we're going to get those guys. Not one swore blood vengeance, not one. And I thought, wow, this is a beautiful country and a wonderful country. And that tells you what that community of Charlottesville is like. That has to be the answer. If people who've just lost a, a neighbor and a friend can do that, um, if, if Jacob Blake's mom, while he's fighting for his life, can do that, then, then I think Joe Biden can do that. And he has. And the Democrats can do that. And they have. You, you just can't, both, I guess, again, strategically and morally, you can't get down on Trump's level. You just can't. And, and I don't think the left has. Uh, the FBI crime statistics say 100% of political murders in the last two years have been committed by the extreme right. And so I think there's this false equivalency. Oh, both sides do it. It's just not true. Well, and, and let's be let's be very clear. The, the killings in Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, during these protests were committed by someone who was a militia member who was who was presumably saying that he was there trying to support the police and he killed two and injured a third in and a teenage Wisconsin. boy right a yeah, teenage yeah. boy allegedly we have to be careful because the right, young right. man has has rights but a teenage boy is under arrest uh and that, as again as a father that just breaks my heart you know but it struck me as i was listening to the, the sheriff in that county today talk about uh the arrest of this 17 year old uh, sort of the i mean it was some it was some professional yoga stretching to try to not actually say that the the guy who the 17 year old had killed someone he said was committed committed a use of firearms trying to manage what i guess he thought was a conflict i mean he went out of his way to not say this yeah. guy killed two people um but you know he also at the same time the sheriff uh, 
sort of, I hate to use, I hate to say victim blaming, but said, had these people not been here after curfew was out, we wouldn't have seen these things. It, there seems to be such a political divide between those who support the police and believe that the police are, the police should be supported. And if you're out protesting and rioting, you are awful. And whatever happens to you, happens to you. And then those who support people like George Floyd and, and recognize that we should not be killing right. unarmed black men. And it's almost that there's, it's, it, it seems to me, and you tell me if, how, how you feel about it, it seems to me like some politicians, especially on the left, are scared to death to crack down on riots because they are concerned that it might upset those protesters who are out there trying to protest. I mean, three nights in, Tony Evers did not, Governor Tony Evers did not mm -hmm. send in a large contingent of National Guard. I think he sent in 125 National Guard members. It is, do Democrats, do Democrat elected officials need to do more than say violence doesn't work, violence is unacceptable? Should the governor have gone in more strongly to suppress some of the riots? Well, I, I literally don't know because I'm not on the ground, and I hate to second guess uh, a governor in a crisis. But of course, rioting is wrong and violence is wrong. But I just think it's a mistake to conflate the vast majority of these protests with violence. The, the huge majority of them have been peaceful. My, 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 my 84-year-old mother went and participated in one of them. And she, well, before the COVID, she goes to church every Sunday and sings in the choir. She is the most devout and peaceful Christian woman you can imagine. Yet she was out there. So I, I think it's it's just wrong to say, well, there are riots. There have been violence, and that's terrible. But we're now seeing that some of that violence at progressive rallies may have been fostered by far-right extremists who are seeking to turn these into violence. Um, I, I, it, some of it, it clearly is authentic uh, from the left. I I'm the but, only I'm the only progressive in my family, so I spend um, a, a good chunk of my day going through my emails and texts mm -hmm. and messages from from family members trying to convince me how wrong I am <laughs> for voting for Democrats. <laughs> um, but I will say I will say this: I got a, I got a message today from my uncle, who you know I I always take the time to read and watch everything that is sent to me, but a message that did make me for the first time go, "Oh shit." There may be a point here. He sort of compared the response from Democrats with violence is wrong. Violence is not the answer. But you have to understand most of these violent, pro most of these protests are peaceful. Protests are not the problem. The violence is the problem. We need to, he, he, he compared that to the same criticism that Democrats give Republicans after there's a shooting. Because most of the time, after there's a school shooting or a mass shooting, uh, I and my fellow progressives say, we're sick and tired of your thoughts and prayers. <laughs> you know, we need to do something about this. We need to have less guns on the streets. We need to have less guns in the hands of the wrong of the wrong people. And Republicans turn and say, yes, but guns are not the problem. The problem is they get in the hands of the wrong people. We don't need to reduce the amount of guns, et cetera, et cetera. Are, are Democrats making essentially the same argument when it comes to uh, saying these riots are not, are not the norm? Most of these are peaceful protests. But that's simply a fact. I, I think there's an enormous difference. You know, I, I'm educated as a lawyer. My right to swing my fist is real, but it ends where your nose begins. And there's a big, big difference. It is true. Almost all of these protests have been deeply patriotic, by which I mean peaceful. And, and wouldn't Republicans they, say almost all gun owners are peaceful well, gun true. owners? Well, it's true. I'm a gun owner. Most gun owners are fine. But the question is, do we need wife beaters to be able to buy a gun? I don't think so. People on the terrorist watch list to buy a gun? I don't think so. So, you know, I think that there's, there's, this is where the gun debate, I think, becomes silly and extreme. Um, they literally, literally don't support denying guns to people who are on the terrorist no-fly list. Like, really? But, but, but coming back to the, the present question, is that protesting is patriotic, no matter which side you're on. But when you start breaking things, then it's criminal activity. Yesterday didn't get covered much but in idaho where i have family 
uh, 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 right wing protesters stormed the state capitol. They broke right. windows and Bundy, took right? over. Uh, uh, he was part of it, and he was mm-hmm. arrested because he wouldn't leave a hearing room. That once you start overwhelming the state police, once you start breaking windows, right or left, that's wrong. That's a crime. But if all they were doing, which uh, uh, sometimes they do, is stand there and cheer and chant, that's their right as Americans. Uh, I just I think that uh, what what the right is trying to do, though, is discredit these heartfelt and heartbreaking calls to simply stop shooting black kids and black adults with with this sort of you know mythical rioting as i say there's a great deal of political violence in america so far all of the murders have been on the far right and if in fact this young man who stands accused is guilty it will be one more even at a, at a, at a left-wing rally uh left-wing protest uh if if in fact he's guilty and and uh, He's certainly uh, being charged. Well, you, you said something there that makes me want to kind of delve into something else you talk about a little bit in your book. Um, you talk about Democrats falling into traps set by Republicans um, and, and uh, tr- Democrats needing to avoid falling into some of these traps. I want to ask you about the identity politics because I want to get to a lot of mm-hmm. other stuff in the book too but to, mm-hmm. in, in order to get to that I want to talk about a little bit of identity politics and and how Democrats have possibly fallen into a trap mm-hmm. set by Republicans when it comes to making so much of the discussion not about the the economic policies of the Democrat party not about the um the things that might affect people's lives and their pocketbooks but the identity politics arguments. Do you think that Democrats have fallen into a trap with, especially this president, that has resulted in white, middle, middle-class working whites in the Midwest fleeing the Democrat Party because they don't feel like there's a place for them there? There, there is some of that, and it has been happening. Um, I think that, um, but I think, again, Joe Biden was a pretty good answer to that. He's middle class Joe from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, I do think it's very, very difficult for the Democrats to hold their coalition together. It's almost impossible. We now you look at the Democratic convention. You went from four star generals to Black Lives Matter. Now, I think that's wonderful. That looks like America. We had John Kasich, a conservative Republican governor of Ohio. Mm-hmm. By the way, who's I looked him up. He served in the House and I knew him then. Bernie Sanders was in the House and in the Senate. So they were there at the same time. John Kasich's conservative writing from the American Conservative <laughs> Union was yeah. over 88. Yeah, Bernie's was under, <laughs> yeah, and Bernie's was six. I don't know what he was six on, but they were both at the same convention speaking on behalf of the same candidate. Now, a way to do that is to keep emphasizing the breadth of your coalition uh, by race, by gender, by generation, uh, by sexual orientation. I, 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 and I celebrate that. But I think you make a point that Every one of those people in that coalition lives in the economy, right? Every one of them needs to make sure that they have a job. Every one of them is susceptible to this god-awful plague of coronavirus, and we need to have a, a, a plan for them. So I'm much more for, you know, the, even though I'm Catholic, I love that Baptist hymn, blessed be the ties that bind, right? I, and the ties that bind are the things that are universal to all of us. And that's that kind of classic middle-class American dream. I want Democrats to focus on jobs, on healthcare, on education, absolutely on rights and on human rights and civil rights and women's rights and gay rights and trans rights. And part of that should be the right to have a decent job and the right to not have your health insurance canceled. So I do think you make a point that if all we say is, look how diverse we are, then there are some people who say, well, wait a minute, do you include me in that? And, and I, 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 you, you've read the book, I excoriate Democrats who attack Trump voters. You know, I I was trained in politics by Bill Clinton. He used to love to quote Abraham Lincoln, who said, I destroy my enemies. I make them my friends. And that's what Democrats need to do with Trump voters. We need to listen to them. We're not going to agree with them on everything. You mentioned the gun issue, gay rights, abortion rights. There's a lot of things that a lot of those guys, many of them are guys, can never support. But there's a lot they can. And and we need to open up that conversation. 
Is there not danger, though, in being one of those moderate Democrats right now who is willing to and interested in, in talk and interested in talking to people on the other side of the aisle? I mean, there was a lot of pushback. Paul, you saw it from it the left, from the left, because John Kasich got more speaking time than AOC did. Right. Um, so, is it is there not a danger to being a moderate in the Democratic Absolutely. Party? Absolutely. Don't you run the risk of becoming Elliot Engel and losing your seat to someone more progressive if you're not? Yes. If you're. So, how do you but solve that within? The that's party? why you get. That's why you get in this business, right? If you're not willing to take a stand, and I think that the stand that. Uh, uh, you know, Barack Obama made to hold his party together. He was far more moderate than the, the Bernie wing of the party wanted. I get that. Joe is probably the fourth or fifth choice of a lot of uh, the far left. And yet, what are they doing? They're busting their tails now for Joe. People for whom Joe was the third or fourth or fifth choice. Uh, I see them. Are they busting their uh, tails for Joe or are they busting their tails to get rid of Trump? Ha, ha, that's a good point, but that's the only way to do it. As opposed to 2016, when a lot of them walked, the third and fourth party candidates did remarkably well, and I don't take anything away from them, but I think some of it was uh, uh, some progressives thought, well, I can cast a protest vote and Hillary will still win anyway, and the arithmetic didn't work. I am not seeing that now. I tell the story in the book about Virginia, where I live. The moderate, Ralph Northam, ran for governor. He was challenged by a, a Bernie-style candidate named Tom Perriello, who was a congressman from Charlottesville. The, and Tom ran on single-payer health care, Medicare for all, very, very, very progressive. And Ralph is a pediatric neurologist. He ran a very kind of moderate, centrist, improving healthcare, expanding Medicaid, but not the, 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 the Bernie dream. Ralph won the primary. And you know what? Tom Perriello knocked his socks off going around the state, the Commonwealth, all over Virginia. And Tom and the left really helped this very moderate man win. And what'd they get? Well, they get in the Robert E. Lee statute torn down, the strongest LGBTQ protections in Virginia history in the entire South. Uh, protecting women's right to choose, re-enfranchising uh, uh, voters who've lost their rights due to having committed a felony in their past. Most importantly, expanding Medicaid to 400,000 Virginians. Ralph Northam is the most progressive governor in Virginia history. And so it showed the left that if they can play ball and support someone who's more moderate from them, they can still get a really terrific progressive agenda. I knew they were going to kill him. Please say FBI. This is Fight Night a new podcast from iHeartRadio. This is the story about two guys from opposite sides of the street. A hustler blamed for robbing the most dangerous gangsters in the country. This is like issued a, a death warrant for me for something that I don't even know anything about. And the cop who tried to save his life. They thought he had robbed a deadliest man in this country. Guys who would not hesitate to blow your head off. In 1970, Muhammad Ali triumphantly returned to the ring. At the hustlers' party that followed, gangsters from around the country were robbed of a million dollars. This story from Atlanta, Georgia, has been reported for 50 years. But now, for the first time, you're going to hear what really happened from the people who lived it. Listen and follow Fight Night on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 13 Days of Halloween. A remote hotel. This, my friend, is Hawthorne Manor. The most unusual guests. They sound like someone you trust. Trick or treat! No, sweetie, don't touch it. Don't look at it. A tour guide that can't be trusted. Was it luck or fate that placed you here? We'll never know. And the newest arrival is you. Why are you here again? I know. Starring Keegan-Michael Key as the caretaker. Please make yourself at home. After all, this is it. Produced in three-dimensional binaural audio to place you right in the center of the story in ways you'll have to hear to believe. For full exposure, listen with headphones or AirPods. One story each night, starting October 19th and ending on Halloween. From iHeartRadio and Blumhouse Television, listen to Aaron Mankey's 13 Days of Halloween on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, the news the news within Virginia, the, the Commonwealth of Virginia, is based mostly within the local markets, correct? I mean, you they don't have you don't have in Virginia and we don't have in North Carolina the problem of 
the Sean Hannity types or the Rachel Maddow types uh, creating and building the talking points and arguments for our gubernatorial candidates in the same way that the president does. I mean, they... Uh, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, listen, I'm, impre- I'm impressed here about the fact that I've, I've tried my best. I love this. I'm glad you're doing it. But I've tried to keep on talking about <laughs> the, the identity politics stuff, and you keep coming back to the economic stuff, which right. I love because I feel like Democrats should do that more often and not take the bait and talk about the, the, the identity politics stuff. But it, it seems that it's impossible for them to do. I mean, the news ends up being about, is he going to pl- pick a black woman as vice president? He must pick a bla- ba- black woman. If you don't pick a black right. woman for, as vice president, you're not going to have a chance with black voters. I don't know if that were true or not, but do you believe that he picked Kamala Harris because she was only because she was the best for the job? Or do you believe that he felt the pressure to pick a black woman? Well, I did not talk to Joe about this, but uh, I've seen this up close. Of course, I worked for Bill Clinton when he picked Al Gore. Um, and I know I've known Joe for goodness, 34 years. So I've known a very long time. I know that it was two things. He, he, he has told friends of mine this. I've not talked to him personally, but he, I've talked to people who are very, very close to him. He told his closest aides, number one, God forbid who could step in. Number two, God willing, <laughs> I remain healthy and alive. Who do I want to be the last person in the room with me? When, when, cause this is what he did for president Obama. President Obama wanted a governing partner, someone who was strong where President Obama was weak. This is what Clinton wanted with Gore. And I think that's what Bush wanted with Cheney, to tell you the truth. I don't support their agenda, but I think Bush understood that he needed experience. Uh, I think Joe understands he needed, you know, youth. He needed a completely different perspective in life. He needed uh, her background, where, which is both uh, as a prosecutor taking on big banks. Uh, he comes from a state where big banks are really powerful. Delaware. So I, I know that that's what he was looking for. It so happens that she's charismatic. She's dynamic. You know, a lot of my friends said, well, she ran a bad campaign. I think that's a virtue. As you know, if you run and lose, you learn a lot. Right. The view from the canvas <laughs> is highly yeah. educational. Right. Right. I mean, I, I've learned more from the races I've lost than the ones I've won. So I actually thought it was a virtue that she had been in the arena um, and she, she flopped miserably. She didn't even make it to Iowa good. (laughs) She learned something. So I'm thrilled with that choice. Uh, I don't think it was political correctness at all. It turns out this is what, and you may experience this, Clay. Growing up, I grew up in a small town in Texas, and I spent a great deal of my time in rural America, um, most of my time. And some of my conservative family and friends, they think that I'm for this diversity because of political correctness. And I keep trying to tell them, no, I am for it because when you expand the talent pool, you get more talent. To me, it's, it's, you know, I'm a sports fan. The Texas Longhorns are only recruiting in Austin. They're not going to get as much talent as if they reach out all the way. The last Heisman Trophy winner Texas had was a a young man who went to high school in San Diego. That's what I want, right? I want to cast as broad a net for talent as possible. That's how you get a Barack Obama, a Hillary Clinton, a Kamala Harris. Those are not choices of political correctness. In fact, Joe Biden will be, for me, the first time in 16 years that this uh, middle-aged straight white man has voted for a a straight white man (laughs) in 16 years. That's not because I'm politically correct. I'm not at all. It's because I really believed that uh, Hillary and Barack would be the best presidents for my country. Why why are you a Democrat at all? Wow, that's a great question. Because I think that they're on the side of, of the little guy and the little gal. I think that they, they're for the people. And I think that um, I, I have a lot of friends and family who are Republicans. I respect that. It seems to me that the basic inclination of that party is to preserve, protect, and defend entrenched power. And I think entrenched power has enough. I really do. I want to, as we say in Texas, I want to put the jam on the lower shelf where the little folk can reach it. And it turns out now that I'm a well-off white guy, I do better too. If we throw open the doors of opportunity, if we have, if we help, you know, uh, uh, my life story, I bet you most Americans are like this. My grandmother came to this country. She didn't have a nickel in her pocket. She didn't speak a word of English. She had about a third or fourth grade education. She got a job as a housemaid. She worked for rich people cleaning their house. And that's honorable work. Well, in her lifetime, she lived to see me 
not only go to high school, which she never did, go to college, go to law school, advise the president of the United States. That's what happens if you take a chance on an uneducated immigrant maid. Is it, it, it works out really well for America. That's why I'm a Democrat. If, if I asked a Republican why they are a Republican, nine <laughs> times out of 10, I would get some sort of, or I will have gotten some, some variation on sort of your answer, which is that person A is a Republican because they believe Republicans are the party of opportunity and are the party of giving people the opportunity to be successful, et cetera. So what, in, what do you think is the difference? I mean, obviously, you may mm-hmm. not see that to be, you may not feel that's accurate. Uh, listen, I've always owned my bias. I don't feel that to be accurate either. But if you had to tell me what the, the main fundamental difference between Democrats and Republicans is, what do you think it is? Well, I wish we were back in the debates before Trump, when there was a principled Republican. Right. Well, yeah, let's, let's with assume. It. Yeah, can we can we can we but just Trump assume that he's not the part of the? Yeah, that's a he's completely a different Republican. thing. Let's but let's tell you know, let's he, talk to me. Answer my question. Answer well, my question as if though it's two thousand eight. <laughs> as if, uh, golly, wasn't that a better world? But but I do have yes. to point out, <laughs> for the first time in memory, I think the first time in history, a political party has no platform. Right. They have said, we won't have a platform. They have a statement of devotion to the dear leader. That's North Korea stuff. That's not freedom. That's not America. We're supposed to have ideas that our parties are organized around. Republican Party was organized around the radical notion that people shouldn't own slaves. That was a very radical, so radical they had to create a new party for it. That's the most honorable tradition in American politics. My party, by the way, has a history and a tradition of racism, segregation, lynching, slavery. And yet we've gone in my lifetime, you're a younger man than I am. I'm 59. In my lifetime, my party has gone from being the party of George Wallace to being the party of Barack Obama. I think that's progress. I think that's wonderful. Um, The Republicans have gone from being the party of Ronald Reagan, the party of Donald Trump. I think that's moving in the wrong direction. Now, but fundamentally, fundamentally around the 2000 period when, uh, or or even the 90s, when parties could agree to disagree a little bit better. What do you, what do you think the main difference is? What, what, what they would say is just what you said. We believe in, uh, in, in opportunity and hope, and uh, we believe in hard work uh, and the American dream. So in that sense, this sort of outcome is the same, and that's honorable. The way they went about doing it then and now was trickle down. You know, right. This is not just Mr. Trump, uh, but I put this on trial in the book. I wish Joe Biden would put it on trial. The Trump tax cut was $2.3 trillion. It's the most expensive thing America has ever done. $2.3 trillion. And it mostly went to corporate America. Again, I am not a socialist. I am open to the argument that we needed to update the tax code, that perhaps some corporations were being disadvantaged in the global economy. I'm open to that. Let's, let's talk. But $2.3 trillion is more than twice what Barack Obama spent to stave off a Great Depression in 2009. So there's no way that 2.3 trillion was needed. And then I looked in researching the book before they passed that corporate tax cut, corporate profits were at a record high. So they were curing a problem that didn't exist. And it makes me furious because at the same time, 71,000 Americans died that year of drug overdoses, 48,000 of them opioids, Um, 30,000 died from handgun violence. Um, There were crises and are crises. Farm bankruptcies are at a record high. Farm income is at a record low. You could have done a ton of good. By the way, our infrastructure is falling apart. You can't drink the water in, in Flint, Michigan, and in other places. You can't drive across a bridge uh, in lots of cities and towns in America, not safely anyway. So I, I, I know that they say that they believe in hope, growth, and opportunity, and I respect that. I think the better way to do that is invest and grow, bubble up. I saw this with President Clinton. You know, we came in, had a huge deficit and a recession, and we cut spending. We did. But what we kept was the stuff that made us smarter and richer and safer and healthier. And that was all investing in poor people in the middle class. And then that bubbled up. And we created the greatest economy in American history, 23 million jobs, more than any president in history. And I saw it work. Um, And we didn't we didn't want to confiscate anybody's wealth or anything. We raised taxes on the rich a little bit, about to 39.6% top marginal rate. That's hardly the 90% we had under Eisenhower, but you know, it was an increase. So I've seen this work. I know it works. The greatest fortune in America, uh, 
it was, it was the Walton family. They started Walmart. Every penny of that came from poor people and middle-class people. Okay. I, I don't think there's a Walmart on Fifth Avenue in New York City, you know, or on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. Walmart is built for poor people and middle-class people. And yet the people who own it built the greatest fortune of any family in America based on those folks. And that's what I want. I, I don't begrudge them their billions. I don't. But it turns out if you want to build something sustainable, you actually have to invest in poor people and middle class. So would it be fair to, to summarize that into Republicans being trickled down and Democrats yes. being bubble up? I think so. so. So where does Trump's policy on trade fit in? On which side of that aisle? Is his policy on trade more aligned with a bubble up philosophy than a trickle down philosophy? Does he, does, do he and Bernie Sanders share that in common? They, they, Bernie is a trade skeptic. A lot of Democrats are on the left. Uh, the way Trump has done this, like always, you know, very often with Trump, there's sort of a nugget of, of truth and reality. And then he does it in the craziest, corrupt way that he can. So China particularly, there's a problem with China. There really is. They don't respect intellectual property. Uh, they, they don't abide by the trade rules that they have pledged to abide by. Most Democrats, if you gave them truth serum, would say, by golly, we got to stand up to China. So what did he do? Before he took on China, he made enemies out of the Canadians, out of the Mexicans, out of the French, out of the British, out of the Germans, out of the Japanese. No, no. If you're going to take on the neighborhood bully, the first thing you do is get all the neighbors on your side. So I, I think the way he has done it, that's first. Second, he really singled out our farmers. It has been hell on the farm. And uh, this breaks my heart because most of them supported him. Trump did great in farm country. And boy, he used them as the instrument of his really self-destructive trade wars. Nothing good has come of all that. It, we got a new NAFTA. Okay, it's pretty much the same as the old NAFTA, tell you the truth. You know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Um, and we got a very small trade deal with China. And in, in the price of that was farmers are going bankrupt. Um, they're losing their herds or their farms. They're God help us, farm suicides are, uh, are way up. Hard statistics to track because we don't keep it as such, but looks like it is. People at like Farm Aid, Willie Nelson's group, tell us that. So I think the way he has done it has been just crazy and, and destructive. And that's, I guess, the typical Trump brand. Um, you mentioned farmers, and I find myself drawn right back to the difference between talking about policy and the identity politics, which seems to just really permeate a lot of what's going on, especially with the Republican Party. I'm thinking about yep. what I saw during the convention the past few nights, and there was such a patriotism or faux patriotism, whatever you want to call it, um, mm -hmm. and, and the, the amber waves of grain, and they had farmers talking about Trump, etc. In your book, and I mean, I, I really want to make sure people pay attention to what you're saying because I personally love it. But you talk a lot about getting away from it and talking about how you can affect people's lives. Right. I just want you to, I mean, I, I feel like I'm asking the same question a hundred times, but say again why, we be, why you believe that this will be effective in a place like Iowa where bubble up policy certainly affects people's lives in a more positive way than trickle down right. policy does, or in Idaho, where Medicaid, Medicare, social Social Security affects an aging population in Florida, and why it's important to talk policy and how Democrats can beat Trump by breaking through with talking about those things. Well, it, it begins with listening, which um, not every Democratic elite is very good at. Uh, just to be honest with you, uh, or Republican elite for that matter. But I'm more concerned about my party. Um, I've been married 31 years. I always tell my boys, the secret to a long relationship is three little words. And it's not, I love you. That's fine for prom night. It is, I hear you. And that's what Democrats need to do. They can't, they're not going to win them all. They're not going to win the majority, but they can lose by less. And that's the difference between winning and losing in an election. Also, they will govern better. You know, we just saw Missouri and Oklahoma in the last few months, vote to expand Medicaid. Missouri and Oklahoma voted for Obama-style socialism. This is what the conservatives call it. Missouri and <laughs> Oklahoma, freaking Homa, are you kidding? Right. So I have to say this as a Texan, you know, I'm a Texas but, Longhorn. 
you know, I, 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 the only reason Texas doesn't break off and float into the Gulf of Mexico is because Oklahoma sucks. But it should be it should be noted, season. by the way, that we it should be noted, by the way, though, that Missouri during the 90s was a relatively democratic state. I mean, right. we're talking about Democrat senators from in a lot of these states like Missouri, the the Dakotas that that switched more recently towards Republicans. Absolutely. But they they were Democrats when Democrats were talking about what, Paul? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no, I think that's a really powerful lesson. And, and I want the elites in my party to see this. You know, I, I, I am old enough to remember the Clinton economic policy. I just bragged about it. It passed by one vote in the Senate. That vote was a Democratic senator from Nebraska, Bob Kerry, Medal of Honor recipient, mm-hmm. amazing man. Flash forward to Obama passing his biggest uh, proposal, which was Obamacare. It passed by one vote in the Senate, also a Democrat, also from Nebraska, Ben Nelson. So if the Democrats want to govern this country effectively, they have to win in places like West Virginia, North Dakota, Kansas, Alaska, right? You can't just run this country on what works for the the coastal elites. I love them. Uh, I do. Uh, But, you know, uh, this is, I I, I was terribly impressed, for example, AOC is a rising star in my party. And she's just terrific. She's incandescent. I think she's so talented. And yet, her message got her precisely 15,895 votes in the Bronx and Queens, two boroughs of New York. Mm -hmm. That's how she beat Joe Crowley, very powerful Democrat. And boy, that's almost a miracle. To do that, my hat is off to her. And I mean that. But what gets you, so that's 15,897 votes she got in that primary against Joe Crowley. Well, I've looked it up. You want to be president, you don't need 15,897. You need 70 million votes from people, some of whom don't live in the Bronx. So in other words, what Believe it or not. (laughs) Right. So I wouldn't tell AOC to run her campaign in, in the Bronx you know, the same way uh, that Barbara Bollier, uh, a, a, a candidate for Senate in Kansas, is running her campaign, right? In fact, Barbara was, she is a doctor. She was a Republican member of the Kansas legislature. Right. She decided that, as Reagan used to say about my party, she, Barbara says, I didn't leave the Republican Party. The Republican Party left me. So what Barbara Bollier runs on, it's going to be really, really different than what AOC runs on. I respect that. We need a big tent. But, but does Barbara Bollier end other. up becoming a a martyr, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> because in the same way that someone like Joe Manchin uh, right. becomes disliked by the Gosh. the left wing of the party? I love Joe Manchin. He has, <laughs> because he has run, well, he runs his campaign like he ran the state of West Virginia when he was governor, like he, right. you know, because he knows his state and he wins that way. But but does he become a martyr? Uh, because people on the because we because we are a country of fifty states, and each fifty each one of the fifty states has individual and different needs. But we look at our elections as if though they are national elections. It's a great and play. and and we don't and AOC isn't concerned with what the people of West Virginia need. She's concerned with what the people of the Bronx need. But you know. What the people of West Virginia need affects her, her affect her in, in, in constituents in some way, and so she right. expects Joe Manchin to vote the way she wants him to. Right? If, if you, that's right. If you want the progressive change that the progressive wing of my party is advocating for, then you have to be willing to support moderates in moderate parts of the country. The hero of my book is Nancy Pelosi, um, because I love her, and uh, I love her personally. She's just a wonderful person. She raised five kids before she ever ran for any office. She lives uh, by Catholic faith as well as anybody I know. Um, and she's a brilliant strategist. She needed 23 Trump districts, Republican districts to flip. She picked up 41, not 23, 41. Every one of them, a Republican congressional district, 41. She did it by having a diverse slate of candidates. Again, more talent, more diversity, uh, more women than ever before more LGBTQ and more military, more intelligence officers and more moderates. Those same folks, the press never gets this. Uh, I, I, Sharice David's a good example. She is a, a, a Native American, lesbian, former mixed martial arts professional fighter. So she's a, a lesbian, Native American kickboxer and a moderate. She won in Kansas, you know, where Democrats usually don't win. 
That's what I'm looking for. And that's what Pelosi is looking for. How did they win? I studied it. Well, I traveled the country. I campaigned for a bunch of these candidates. They, were, they ran on healthcare, prescription drugs, all the things you and I are talking about. None of them ran on Russia. None of them ran on Mueller. None of them ran on impeachment. None of them ran on Trump. They ran on your life, not Trump's. And that's what Democrats need to do in this election. And Nancy Pelosi is, is wise enough to understand that if a candidate needs to distance themselves from her for their benefit, she doesn't take it personally. Right. She's a professional. She, it's she, just, it's just win. Do baby. what you need she, to do to win. <laughs> and she, right. she's, she's and willing to let, yeah. Look what happened. Her strategy, the San Francisco liberal, her strategy won in Oklahoma, in Kansas, in Texas. Both the neighborhoods of both of the Bush presidents, one in Houston, one in Dallas, are both. Do you now think the, the Dems most, are doing this? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. That's all. why they nominated. Do you think Joe. they're doing it? That's do you think they're doing it correctly now? Then you do believe, and uh, even down I to do. this congressional level, do you think that they're doing a good enough job of not talking about Russia, of not talking about Mueller, of not talk, but instead across the board in congressional districts, in go- what few gubernatorial races are up, the Senate races that are up? Do you think that Democrats across the board are following Joe's lead and talking about issues versus Trump? I think so. I really do. Uh, the woman who runs the um, House Democratic Campaign Committee, congressional, it's called Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, is named Sherry Bustos. Sherry has a very Trump district. Trump won her district overwhelmingly. And what an advantage. Her husband is the local sheriff in their small town. She gets it. And it, she, this, is, this is the whole reason you get into this business is to make a difference in people's lives. And this is the Trump trap, is that his personal behavior is so piggish and it's appalling in a way that we've never seen in a way of course george w bush never was or john mccain never was or ronald reagan never was or mitt romney never was that some democrats get distracted by that pelosi sherry bustos uh senator Catherine cortez masto who runs the democrat senate campaign committee they have kept our eyes on the prize and i i I think that's the winning strategy it's also as, as i say the better way to govern this country is to actually talk about voters' lives, not Trump's life. Trump's going to be fine either way. He's rich and whatever. Um, he's going to be just fine. What does Biden the need to do differently you? in your mind right now? And again, then we've got some quick fire questions from our listeners for you. But what, what yeah. do you think that Biden, if, if you could change one or two things about what he's doing or has done thus far to just he, really make it better, easier for him to beat Trump, what would you tell him? He needs to do better with younger voters. And in the book, I suggest that he come out for a radical expansion of national service, AmeriCorps, which my boss Bill Clinton created, which President W. Bush then protected and President Obama expanded. But AmeriCorps only has 75,000 people in it right now. It should have a million. There's 45 million young people between the age of 20 and 30. Uh, A great number of them unemployed because of this god-awful COVID virus. Let's put them to work. Not free college. Put them to work. Let them serve their communities, uh, helping uh, assist people with COVID or mentoring kids who are locked out of their classrooms or fixing up our national parks or rebuilding our infrastructure or building the kind of uh, green homes and buildings that we need to save the planet. There's, there's tr- I think he should come out for at least a million people in AmeriCorps. Put those young people to work. Clay, I believe as the father of four of them and a, a professor at Georgetown, as I've known hundreds of them, this next generation is going to be the greatest generation all over again. I think they're the best young people I've ever seen. And he should harness that patriotism not for free stuff. I'm against free college because two reasons. It's free and it's college, right? I want people to earn educational benefits by serving and they can go to community college, junior college, university, whatever they want. So that's what I want Joe to do. And I'm, I'm begging him on this podcast. I'm begging him in my book, throw open the doors of opportunity through national service and you will be astonished at how patriotic this generation is. I, I said I wanted to go to quick fire, but you saying that makes me want to ask one more question before we do. I, 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 we talked to plenty of political consultants and advisors on this podcast, but almost to a person, they all talk about strategy. They talk about, you know, polls, et cetera. You talk so much about policy. Why have you never run for anything? Why have <laughs> oh, you no, chosen never. not to? I was the student body president at the University of Texas at Austin, which is, in my world, the highest office I could ever aspire to. <laughs> um, I, I think I can make a bigger difference helping a lot of other people uh, who have a heart to serve, um, like you. People who I so respect anybody that puts their face, name, tail on the line. Um, and I, I think I can do more good helping them. 
Okay, well, your policy ideas are brilliant. If you're listening, I, I really highly recommend you picking up uh, the book, You're Fired, The Perfect Guide to Beating Donald Trump. And it's, it's, it's as entertaining and funny in parts as the title suggests it might be. But unlike other books about other books written by political consultants and advisors and pundits, it's got a lot of really incredible policy positions and ideas in it. And that's why I, you know, I, I obviously keep doing what you're doing because I, I think God knows the party needs you. But it's, it's refreshing to see someone back up to hear someone and read someone back up the ideas, not just with, it, not, not, not only not just attacking, but specifically saying, don't just attack Donald Trump. Here are some things that Democrats want to do and can do and should do that will make a difference in people's lives. And that's how you win. And I, and I for one, certainly agree with you that that's not something we see enough of right now. Well, um, thank you. I, I, wish, I wish I had thought of this, but it was actually in the onion of all places. They had a headline. Okay, well, they're, they're, they're more accurate than some stuff I read on the news. They the are. Other sources nowadays. <laughs> I've, I've been doing this all my life and they're better than I am at it. Here's what the headline <laughs> said. Undecided voter just wants to hear a little bit more about Donald Trump. Right. right. No, no, Isn't listen. that preposterous? It's like, it doesn't what, make, what do you it, not it, know? There's I nothing, hate him. If, if it, hasn't, if it hasn't changed, yeah. if it hasn't helped an undecided make up their mind yet. Right then it's not going right. to all of a sudden make them make up their mind now. And I, I totally exactly. agree with you. Um, a few questions from some of our listeners they've sent in. Yes, Sean, from Sa- Sean from San Francisco asks, should Julian Castro have been given a speaking spot at the convention? Three words. I don't care. I'm okay. sorry. We got 178. That- no, seriously. I, I, he's a politician. He's a good guy. I know him. He was a great mayor. He's a fine cabinet member. He'll be fine. I, I'm sorry. I just don't have time to worry about his feelings or his profile. You don't have, have to. You don't have to qualify it or explain right. it to me. We're losing I, a thousand I love people that, a day. I love that I, I you mean, don't just, take the bait on the on those on those <laughs> issues. So that, I think that's I, great. I, you know, people were complaining that AOC didn't get get enough time. That may be. I think she's a terrific star. She got a minute and a half. Jim Clyburn only got three minutes. Jim Clyburn is the biggest single reason Joe Biden is a nominee. He only got three minutes. AOC got a minute and a half. She should have gotten more. Jim Clyburn should have gotten more, but the people running that convention were trying to get an awful lot of people on and off the stage. I have nothing against Julian. I like him enormously, but I just don't care if he gives a speech at a convention. And I bet you, except for his mom, no one else does. There you go. Um, Nina from Alexandria uh, it asks, is our future permanent gridlock? No, no, it just can't be. We've had periods like this before and then the the gridlock breaks. Um, they're, just too much we need to do. This is the tragedy of Trump, Clay. When he came in, I, I talked to one of the senior Democrats in the United States Senate who said, you know, Trump campaigned on a trillion dollar infrastructure plan. And if he leads with that, I'll be with him. Now, this is at a time when the Women's March had been the largest mass movement in American history. So angry was the base of my party uh, and the heart of my party with Trump. It, but if he had led with that, if he had come to the Democrats and said, look, uh, you guys want to rebuild, because there's nothing partisan about roads, and bridges, and classrooms, you know, water systems, sewer systems. If he had done that, he could have broken the gridlock. But instead, he, he went to the most partisan things he could, repealing Obamacare, taking people off their health care if they have a pre-existing condition. So it all went to hell. I, I want Joe to win, and I want him actually to move on things that both parties can agree on and should agree on. And uh, infrastructure is the top of my list. I think services too. There's a terrific number of Republicans who support national service. So I, I, I that's what I want to do. I want to, in the, in the peace process, they call it confidence building measures, right? When you're negotiating peace, you don't begin with the hardest things. You begin with things that oh, they're at the margins and everybody can agree on. Okay. Carrie from Tampa. This is going to be a fun one for this redneck of me trying to pronounce some of these words. Is, she asks, is social media a democratizing or demagogic? Is it demagogic force? Demagogic? Yeah. It, demagogic. Is social media a democratizing or demagogic force? You know, it, it's, I did not foresee this. I'm not a social scientist. It has been really destructive. It's been very helpful in many ways and it has empowered people and that's good. But oh my stars, has it divided us? And um, right. I'm on Twitter, and I, I sometimes think it should be called Hater. And the last two years, <laughs> exactly. for for Lent, I'm a faithful Catholic. So for Lent, yeah, I used to give up cursing because I have a potty mouth. I used to give up drinking because I like beer. Last two years, I gave up Twitter. 
And it was a cleansing for my soul. I'm not kidding. Mm-hmm. That sounds very, I'm sure, very sort of uh, hyperbolic, but, but it has pulled us apart. Um, uh, my sons uh, are all in their 20s. One's in college, three are out, and they're much smarter than I am. And one of my boys explained this to me. He said, You know, daddy, if you're in the grocery store and you just yell out, Trump's a pig or whatever, Pelosi's an idiot, right? Somebody's going to say to you, <laughs> they're going to say, Hey, knock it off, Clay. Come on. <laughs> like, I'm just exactly. trying to buy my Twinkies here. I just, you know, back off. But if you do that on social media, even though it offends people, you get rewarded. You get these little likes and that feeds your, uh, uh, your, your ego. And so there's none of the guardrails that govern us in our real lives because we're anonymous. Uh, so, and we don't see I, I how it affects someone on the other side of the, you know, it, it completely removes empathy. We don't see the person crying on the other end of the computer in the same way we would see them crying if we said it to their face. That's, and that's, that, see, that's, that's seeing, thing. yeah, seeing someone cry is what makes us not be jackasses to people because we have empathy, at least a basic empathy. But it's easy to just completely ignore that someone is shedding a tear 10 towns away because you don't have to see them. That's exactly right. Well, that's why you're a great guy and a great artist is that you can feel other people's pain. I, I really believe that that's the soul of morality. Certainly soul of my religion, I suspect yours. It's the soul of, of Confucianism and Islam and Judaism and Hinduism of every great religion and every great philosophy is thinking about other people before yourself. Social media decouples us from that too often. And so in that sense, I think your, your listener is right. Uh, it, it's, been, it's been destructive to our democracy. By the way, it also allows Russian agents and others to come in and infiltrate, it, infiltrate us. Right. One last question from a listener, Josh from Austin. This is going to be a tough one for you. I can tell. Josh from Austin. <laughs> yeah, Josh from course. Austin asks, what's the best school in Texas? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you read the book, every time I refer to the University of Texas, I say the greatest university in the world. And uh, yeah. it, it is. I, I am the proudest Longhorn you can be. I, I went to school there. I was a student body president there. I was, went to law school there. I was a faculty member, professor there. I met my wife there. She has three degrees there. And now our son has just graduated from there. So I'm as longhorn. By the way, during this quarantine, I'm, I'm on my, this farm in Virginia. I did something I've wanted to do all my life. I went out and bought two Texas longhorn steers. Their names are Vince Young and Earl Campbell, two great Texas football players. So I'm now the owner of two longhorns. So yeah, I'm kind of, kind of uh, cut me and I, I bleed burnt orange. You probably have some of that Carolina blue in your state. Absolutely, no doubt, no question. But but to 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 wrap up, I want to ask: you're a, you're a huge Longhorn fan, but you're still able to be friends with people who are Cornhuskers fans or Texas A and M fans, right? You know, we th- there are few things in our society that people are more loyal to. Honestly, at least in my life, I grew up in in the Triangle, so either a Tar Heel, a Blue Devil, right. or a Wolfpack fan, and people are loyal. It's hardcore. And I know it's the same way in Texas, and I know it's the same way all over the country. We love the sports team or the or the college that we support, but but we still are friends <laughs> right. with those who disagree with us. So it's extending that into politics in the in the recent in the past 10, 15 years, especially, it's gotten to a place where if you wear blue, you can't stand someone who wears red and vice versa. So Paul Begala, how the heck are we going to get along? Well, here's my test. Here's the Begala test. You have to know, like, respect, and yes, even love someone on the other side. I can say that about people who support Donald Trump. I can. Uh, I'm blessed to be able to say that, that I have friends, close friends, family members who love and support Donald Trump, who I can't stand. I'm not like into undecided mm-hmm. on Trump. And vice versa. If you're a Trump person, you need to be able to look in the mirror and say, yes, I, I know, like, respect, and even love someone who's for Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, AOC. Um, that's a test of a democracy. Um, and if we can't do that, we're not going to be able to get very far because this is a big, diverse country. And uh, you're right. We do it with athletics. Th- as you can tell, nothing is more central to my identity except family and faith than my Texas Longhorn loyalties. <laughs> but <laughs> right. my godson and nephew went to Texas A&M. What do you want me How to do How dare it? they? Yes. And he's <laughs> the greatest kid in the world. So 
we 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 do that in our real lives. I've I've I rarely see a business with a sign out front that say says uh, you know no shoes, no shirts, no Democrats, <laughs> or no Republicans. Right. right? We don't do that in our real lives, our personal lives, or our business lives. We ought not do it in our political lives. I could not agree more. The book is "Your Fired: The Perfect Guide to Beating Donald Trump." Um, and and again, I repeat, it's got a lot in it that that ex- explains why it's important to beat Donald Trump. But don't let the title fool you into believing that it's just that. There's a lot of incredible policy discussion, and and really a lot of discussion about how the best way to beat Donald Trump is to really focus on what uh, Paul and Democrats like him and myself um, believe Democrats can do for this country. And I am so thrilled that you were willing to talk to us, Paul Begala. Um, if you're if you're listening, I hope you go and try to pick this book up somewhere. Um, you're fired. The perfect guide to beating Donald Trump. Paul Begala, thank you again so much for oh, being here. You're so kind. Thank you for having me on. This is a, this is a, a real treat. After you listen to today's podcast, here's one to add to your playlist. I'm Christian O'Connell, and I've had this thought for a while. What if you took the world's funniest and most interesting people... Hello, I'm Ricky Gervais. I'm Celeste Barber. Some people call me Beyonce. I'm Russell Brand. ...and asked them to share the stories behind their three most treasured items. No doubt about it, the guitar. I think I know the same chords now as I did when I was 14. From iHeartRadio, this is The Stuff of Legends. Add it to your playlist for free. Just search for Stuff of Legends in your podcast app. 13 Days of Halloween. A remote hotel, the most unusual guests, a tour guide that can't be trusted. And the newest arrival is you. Why are you here again? They sound like someone you trust. I know you can hear me. Starring Keegan-Michael Key as the caretaker. Please make yourself at home. After all, this is it. One story each night starting October 19th and ending on Halloween. From iHeartRadio and Blumhouse Television, listen to Aaron Mankey's 13 Days of Halloween on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.